Well, here we are again today. We want to uh, continue discussing that Keynesian macroeconomic model, uh, which we were doing last time. Let me give you a kind of a quick review, and then we'll do a few word uh, uh, problems, I should say. Um, We've got different symbols, of course, that we're using down here, but they all represent macroeconomic output in the economy. Um, what we want to do is draw the 45 degree line, and we've called that the total production curve. It's basically the value of total production. If real GDP is $100, what's the value of total production? Well, it's $100. And so the slope of this curve is 1. Okay. We also then last time put in a total expenditure curve. Let me start the curve off. Oh, maybe I'll even use a different color here. Uh, total expenditures equal consumption plus investment spending plus government spending, government purchases I should say, plus net exports. This amount of spending is called autonomous spending. And it's called autonomous. It's unrelated to income or production. It's just a certain amount. And then what we also see, though, is that there's a slope to the curve that uh, as income goes up, people spend more or whatever. And so this curve has this induced component to it, induced spending versus autonomous spending. Anyway, equilibrium occurs at the point where total expenditures equal total production. Uh, QE or YE depends on the symbols that you want to use to represent that. But basically, that's the equilibrium level of income. OK. Now, how much is this? this level of income. There's a formula for that. The equilibrium level of income is equal to autonomous spending times a multiplier, which is 1 over 1 minus the MPC, marginal propensity to consume. So this level of income in the diagram that's the, that I've called the equilibrium, we can calculate that if we know two pieces of information. One piece of information, what is total autonomous spending? And the other piece of information is, what's the marginal propensity to consume? And, and of course, the slope of the total expenditures curve is equal to the marginal propensity to consume. OK. So on test day, what I would do is tell you something like this. Oh, total autonomous spending is $100. And the MPC is equal to uh, 0.75. And then I would say to you, hey, calculate the equilibrium level of income for the economy or equilibrium production level for the economy. And then what you would do is you would come along here and say, OK, $100 times 1 over 1 minus 0.75 is equal to $100 times 1 over 0.25 is equal to $100 times 4 or $400. This is QE. And so if we know this amount, $100, and we know the slope is 0.75 of the total expenditures curve, then we know that equilibrium level of income is $100, or $400. Let me mention something to you. This formula here for the multiplier, this 1 minus the MPC, that's also equal to the marginal propensity to save. If you remember, the marginal propensity to consume plus the marginal propensity to save equals 1, or 100%. And so when I say 1 minus a MPC, that's also just equal to the marginal propensity to save. So I could have said the multiplier is 1 over the MPS. You should also be familiar, and we did, I think, some of these problems the other day. You should be familiar with uh, just calculating multipliers. If I tell you that the marginal propensity to consume is 2 thirds, uh, what's the multiplier? If I tell you the mar marginal propensity to consume is 
0.55, what's the multiplier? And you need to be familiar with sort of putting that number two-thirds in right here. If it's two-thirds, one over one minus two-thirds is equal to one over one-third is equal to three. So if the marginal propensity to consume is two-thirds, the multiplier is three. And so you need to be comfortable with doing that. Uh, those types of calculations. Then this type of calculations goes beyond just the multiplier. This tells me that the multiplier is equal to 4, that is the MPC does, but I also need to multiply that 4 by total autonomous spending. Let's uh, expand this example a little bit. Total autonomous spending. equals, let's add some things together, C0, this is autonomous consumption spending, plus I0, this is autonomous business investment spending, businesses purchasing capital goods and so forth. And by the way, I won't go into that. G0, autonomous government spending. That zero is telling us it's autonomous, that it's over here. If the level of income is zero, then how much would the spending be? Plus net exports, zero. And one more thing that we haven't really talked about before, minus. MPC times T. And I'm only telling you about this now because in the next chapter uh, uh, or unit of material we'll be talking about fiscal policy. But this is tax collections. I should say personal tax collections. And the MPC, you know what that is, marginal propensity to consume. So. We need to take into account, or we have, at least we eventually will, and I don't want to give you a formula that's incomplete right now, just because we haven't yet gotten to talking about taxes. But later on, we will come back and put in taxes into this formula. So this will be our autonomous spending figure. So I may say something to you like this. Um, consumption spending, $20. Autonomous consumption. Autonomous investment, 25 Government, 30 Net exports, minus 10 Taxes, um, well, what do we make it? Let's say $10 also. MPC, 0.75. So I would give you these amounts, and these are all dollar amounts. This minus 10 for net exports, that's telling us that net ex exports are exports minus imports. And if this is a negative number, that says that our imports are greater than our exports. We're running a balance of trade deficit, more on that later in the semester. But anyway, what's total autonomous consumption spending? 20 and 25 is 45, 75 <coughs> minus 10 is 65, minus, so taxes are going to lower autonomous spending, but minus 75% of $10, so that would be 750. What would that be? Uh, 50, 750? So given these numbers, and this is the only reason I'm doing this is test day, I will give you some numbers like this. They'll be a little bit different, but the idea is there. We've got $57.50 worth of autonomous spending. The multiplier is 4, and so the equilibrium level of um, GDP is 57.50 or times 4, $230. I would urge you to uh, practice that. What's that $230? Okay. Uh, oh, I know what I want to do next. Our next thing is to come along and say, suppose there is a shift in this curve. <coughs> TE2, well, how much did it shift? Um, let's say something like this happened. Autonomous investment spending went up to $45. Then that would mean this total expenditures curve shifted upward by $20, because only one component changed by that much. Now that's $77.50. 
Is that right? <coughs> 7750 times 4 is $310. And what we can see again is we've got an extra $20 worth of spending, and that resulted in an extra $80 worth of equilibrium GDP or income. And so the relationship between those two of $20 leads to $80 worth of income, and that goes along with our multiplier of four. Um, let me do a little erasing and draw you the aggregate demand curve that goes along with this. If you remember, Keynes assumed this aggregate supply curve that was horizontal. This is, uh, we're going to draw an aggregate demand curve. There's our aggregate supply. And so in this particular case where there's a $20 increase in some autonomous cons component of spending and then the equilibrium income increases by $80, here's what we're saying is happening. The aggregate demand curve was in one particular position to begin with. Equilibrium was $230. That was GDP. And then when this autonomous investment spending went up, the aggregate demand curve shifted to the right to AD2, and the equilibrium level of income would now be $310. So what we are learning from this picture, this is the one that Keynes did back, well, actually, Keynes never draw, drew any diagrams. He did it all mathematically. But the Keynesians who came along and followed him, they uh, took the mathematics transformed it into diagrams. Their diagram assumes this passive aggregate supply. All you have to do is demand more and we'll produce more. And so under that environment, and that's what this curve shows also, this uh, 45 degree line, it says, hey, if you want us to produce more, we can. If you want us to produce out here or here or here, we don't care, we'll produce all you want. So anyway, in this situation, an increase in, in uh, total expenditures through this, uh, I've given an example of investment spending going up, that would cause equilibrium level of income to rise by $80 under that situation of passive aggregate supply. In reality, we do not face this passive aggregate supply curve. I shouldn't say in reality. During Keynes's reality, we did. But the point is, is in reality, maybe today we, uh, we face an aggregate supply curve that's upward sloping, very steep perhaps. So we don't actually move all the way out to 300, and I'll just kind of draw this here, AS. We don't actually move with this given, uh, with the increase in investment spending that we had here, we don't actually move all the way out from 230 to $310 level, uh, $310 worth of e, uh, income. We don't actually make that full trip from point A to B. We go up to point C, and the reason for that is as demand starts to grow, the unemployment rate is going down. As we start moving this direction, there's more people with jobs, wages start to rise, and so this curve doesn't look horizontal, it's got an upward slope to it due to the fact that wages and factor prices and so forth are responding to this um, increased demand. But the point is, is that all Keynes is really telling us with this story is nothing about this point C and this new equilibrium. He doesn't get to that. What he's doing is showing us the size of the aggregate, uh, of the shift in the aggregate demand curve. And if we had an $80 increase here, that means that the aggregate demand curve is shifting to the right by $80. And then it's, we also have to investigate what's going on with aggregate supply to know where the new equilibrium is. Keynes's equilibrium, here's, let me put A and B. Keynes's equilibrium from point A to point B, that's great if we have this passive aggregate supply, we move from point A to point B. But I'm saying that in reality, in our reality, um, that's not the aggregate supply curve. So that's not the end of the story, this point B. Nevertheless, what we are trying to do is understand what's going on with aggregate demand. And we could come back here and, and could have done the same thing. It could have been government spending or autonomous consumption spending that could have risen by $20. And we would have had exactly this, these same shifts and exactly that same result with respect to equilibrium income. Any questions about this? A lot of what we're doing here is review, <clears throat> but not all of it. OK. Uh, here's a question for you. 
What caused these things to shift? Change in autonomous consumption, uh, change in autonomous investment, and so forth. What caused those to happen? We've talked about some of these uh, already. <clears throat> autonomous consumption spending, that could change due to, oh what, changes in expectations. Uh, I'll put a little delta sign there. Changes in expectations uh, of prices. For example, if you think prices are going to go up, it's a good time to go out and spend your money today before the prices go up. And if you go out and spend that money today before the prices go up, consumption spending rises. Uh, change in wealth of households. Here's a good example for you. This is taking place and has been for several years. What happens is the stock market goes up. Stock prices go up. It was going up this morning before I came in. So stock prices go up. People say, gosh, you know, I made $10,000 last year in the stock market. I didn't actually make that. I'm saying people say that. So somebody says, I made $10,000 in the stock market. And then they start saying, I kind of feel pretty well off, you know. That's kind of like getting a raise in pay. And then what they might say is something like this. Heck, I think I'm going to go out and buy a new car. A new car? You can't buy a new car with $10,000. No, but next year I'll make another $10,000, and then a year after that another $10,000. You know, the stock market's going to go up forever. So I'll just go out and buy a new car, and then each year I'll take a little bit of my gains from the stock market, and I'll pay for that car. That's happening in the United States and has been for several years. People are saving very little in terms of saving out of their current income. They spend out of their current income because they say, my savings are growing anyway, the stock market's going up. People feel a wealth effect. And I haven't written that term down here, but um, there's a wealth effect from the stock market. I want to be careful and not just leave it at that. There's not always a wealth effect. And well, there's always a wealth effect. Sometimes it's negative, though. Stock market can go down. It has gone down many times. And so if the stock market goes down, then we say, oh, man, I feel miserable. I lost $10,000. And then somebody says, hey, let's take a vacation. And you go, oh, no, man, I cannot take a vacation. I am suffering here. I lost $10,000. That will teach you not to get in the stock market. No, uh, the stock market goes up over long periods of time. It goes down some days, other days it goes up. Basically, over the long run, the stock market will go up two days for every day it goes down. And so over the long run, the stock market's going up. And so over the long run, we have more and more of this wealth that's growing. And so that encourages us to spend more and more. Let's talk about investment spending. What could affect that? Here's one thing, a change in interest rates. You know, businesses finance a lot of their investment. And by investment, you know, it's, we're not talking about buying stocks and bonds. I wanted to draw that distinction since we were just a moment ago talking about stocks. What we're talking about with respect to investment here, we're talking about buying capital equipment, buildings, new structures, new tools, uh, investing in inventories, and so forth. But if interest rates go up, businesses then say, business managers say, gosh, that means I'm going to have to make a higher payment every month if I want to build a new factory. If it's a $10 million building I want to build, and the interest rate goes up from 8% to 9%, then that's going to cost me an extra 1% of $10 million. That's going to, oh boy, can I do that? 1% of $10 million is $100,000 a year. That's going to cost me an extra $100,000 a year in interest. And then, I don't know if I'm going to go ahead and build that, uh, that factory. And so anyway, higher interest rates, lower investment. There's a negative relationship here between interest rates and investment. The interest rate's up, the investment down, negative relationship. And by the way, interest rates come down, investment will go up. And so very often what we'll see is interest rates are maybe the Federal Reserve is causing interest rates to come down with its policies, and then business investment will respond by going up. What else? How about um, change in pessimism? I'll say mood. 
and then I'll write down pessimism and optimism. By the way, Keynes thought this was extremely important. Here's what he said. He said, you know, these, these capitalists, mm, they look like the captains of industry, but they're kind of timid people inside. And something can go wrong and they just get chicken and just run the other way and they refuse to invest. And at other times they feel real aggressive and, you know, like, oh, I'm ready to invest. And so what he said is investment very often is responding to these sort of moods that run through the business community. Optimism, pessimism. And he says that those swings in the mood, that can have a much bigger impact on investment spending than changes in interest rates or really anything else. And he said that what happened during the Depression was business. And in fact, he said this is what started the Depression. You may want to think about this. And by the way, I don't agree with him. But Keynes said what started the Depression is really businesses became pessimistic and they just were reluctant to invest. Let's follow that through. Let's say that our original, we get rid of these A's and B's because we don't need those. Let's say that our original total expenditure curve was this, the top curve, which I've labeled TE2. And suppose then businesses, business managers become pessimistic and say, oh man, I'm afraid to invest. And so this curve shifts downward. There's less autonomous investment spending. The curve shifts downward and then the economy shrinks by, in this particular case, $80. And so if the economy began at, let's say, full employment, natural, real GDP, all of a sudden we're in a recessionary gap. And so that's what Keynes said happened to basically get the recession or the depression of the, in, in England in the 20s and 30s, in the United States, the depression of the 30s. But he said it was these timid business managers they wouldn't invest, the, curve, the total expenditures curve shifts down, equilibrium GDP falls, and then we're just stuck in a recession. Stuck. What do we do about it? Well, you could come along you know, and cheer up these business managers. And, come on, come on, things aren't as bad as you think. But that won't work. In fact, that was really my idea to cheer them up. Nobody's ever mentioned doing that before. Some kind of maybe uh, a getaway thing, a love boat cruise in the Caribbean. Anyway, I don't know what I'm talking about here, uh, but I think that would be a good idea for a new policy. Keynes says these guys became pessimistic and the economy fell apart. And if you can't come out here and jolly these guys up and somehow get them to reverse their decision to not spend, he said, we're just going to stick back here in this depressed situation. And then our next unit of material, we'll come back to what he said to do about that. Hey, it's the government's job to come in and offset those shifts in investment. If you see business investment go down by a certain amount, here it was $20. If you see business investment spending go down by a certain amount and that slows down the economy, he said, why don't you have the government come back in and spend money and do something about that? So if there's a decrease of investment spending by $20, then how about let's increase government spending by $20 and the economy, you know, so the curve shifts down, total expenditures down, and then back up with the, here's investment down, government up, and, and then we keep the same old equilibrium. And that's really what the next unit of material is about, is fiscal policy. Let me talk about this for just a second. Changes in government purchases. Don't forget, this is not government spending because the government spends some money just as transfer payments. This is government purchases of goods and services. Why would that shift? You know, the, uh, for two reasons I can think of. One reason is fiscal policy. which I was just talking about a moment ago, there can be a change in government spending because the government says, we want to basically influence the economy. We want to stimulate the economy or we want to slow down the economy. That's fiscal policy. Again, we come back to that later on. Mm, there's another reason that government spends though, in public goods. Sometimes the government, sometimes, usually, when the government's spending, it's not spending trying to manipulate the economy. Usually when the government is spending, it's doing so because they think 
you know there are goods that, goods and services, but there are goods and services out there that the public wants. And this term public goods, it's a technical term. I don't mean to say the way it just sounded. I don't mean to say with this term public goods, oh, goods and services the public wants. Don't mean it like that. Economists use this term in a technical way. And what they mean by public goods is goods that provide benefits to virtually everybody in society simultaneously. Okay, so what I'm saying is, is that if the uh, government came out and let's say it was just like, oh, I don't know, building, what would they build? Uh, I don't want to get into bad examples. Let me get into a good example. National defense. National defense is an example of a public good. When the government purchases that good and provides it to me, they provide the same national defense to you. It's impossible for another nation to attack me and my home without simultaneously attacking you. When the government has national defense spending and deters the, the, the foreign attack against me, the government's also deterring foreign attack against you and everybody else in the United States. And so public good is a good that provide benefits to virtually everybody in society simultaneously and secondly it's really kind of hard to exclude these people from consuming these that is to say if the government provides national defense for me and then turns to you and says well we're defending you too why don't you pay us you could just say hey I don't want to pay and don't defend me if you don't feel like it well the thing is, is, that's easy to say, but the government doesn't have that choice. Once they get the national defense in place to defend me, you're automatically defended. So public goods have those two characteristics, providing benefits to virtually everybody in, so in society simultaneously, and we can't really put a price tag on it where we charge each individual consumer. Um, it's not possible to exclude non-payers from consuming. Anyway, so there's two reasons that government could, could be spending money. It could be that all of a sudden there's a, a big foreign threat to our uh, nation's security. And if so, the government will say, oh, we need to have more defense spending, and the government will go out and spend more, and that will affect the economy. But it will not affect the economy sort of on purpose. That is to say, there was no attempt in this story to influence the economy. It was just an attempt to defend the country. Fiscal policy, we're really talking about where the government spends or doesn't spend trying to influence the economy. And it's not like, well, we need to be defended. It's more a case of, well, we need to get out of this recession. Or we need to fight inflation. Or whatever the problem is, that's what fiscal policy does. So anyway, we were really going through the list of what influences each one of these components of autonomous spending. And I'm saying there's a couple things there. Uh, net exports. What influence is that? How about two things in particular? Uh, changes in exchange rates, the value of the dollar relative to the value of other currencies. Let's give an example. Suppose the dollar strengthens. Suppose the dollar gets more valuable relative to other currencies. Okay, if that happens, then well, let's, uh, let's give us something specific here. Let's say Japan, uh, the United States, Japan, let's say the exchange rate's 100 to 1. 100 yen equals $1. Okay. Now, let's say the dollar strengthens. Then it might take 110 yen to buy $1. Now the dollar's 10% stronger. And what I'm saying is this, is if we have something to sell, let's say an airplane, for $50 million to Japan, this might be some uh, airliner that Boeing manufactures. If we have a $50 million airline to, pay, to send to Japan, to sell to Japan, in the first instance where the exchange rate was 100 to 1, then they say, oh man, and how much is that? I don't even know, billions. Uh, but in the first instance, the Japanese say, oh, it takes 100 yen to buy each dollar. We need $50 million. And so that's a certain number of yen to buy that airplane. But when the dollar strengthens, and now it takes 110 yen to buy that same dollar. More yen to buy the dollar, the dollar's stronger. Now it takes more yen to buy that airplane. It's still $50 million, but now it's 10% more yen than it was a moment ago. So when the dollar strengthens, our exports go down. Our product becomes more expensive. People less overseas less willing to buy it. So a stronger dollar, stronger dollar, leads to reduced exports by the U.S. and also to increased imports.
Okay. A second thing, changes in foreign uh, GDP. How does that work out? Suppose that people in France had their incomes go up. Gross domestic product, their economy is expanding, the incomes are going up. Suppose that happens. Then the people in Japan feel, in Japan, France, feel more prosperous. They say, hey, our incomes are going up. They probably say that in some French uh, accent. Hey, our incomes are going up. Let's buy things. And some of the things they buy are from France, some are from Germany, some are from the United States. And so if foreign GDPs are rising, U.S. exports are going to be rising. People overseas are better off, more prosperous, and they can afford to buy more things from their own countries as well as from the United States. So our exports rise. Okay, so that is a partial list. You can think of additional things to put on the list. Interest rates changing, that would probably also affect uh, consumer, uh, autonomous consumption spending, because mm, interest rates changing, that would affect the amount of a car payment you would have to make or something like that, a house payment. And so you could add additional things to the list, but those are good things right there. I didn't go ahead and talk about taxes, but if taxes changed, which we will talk about in the next unit of material, that would also affect autonomous spending. So, any questions about this? That's where I want to stop talking about this material and then go on to that next unit of material and talk about fiscal policy. Gosh, I feel like we've already gotten pretty deep into it because I've been talking about taxes and government spending. And so, why don't we do that and just go on and talk about fiscal policy. I will add one thing, I think I made that clear, but all these things we've been talking about, for the most part, I've been increasing total expenditures and shifting the aggregate demand curve to the right and so forth. This all can work in reverse. If investment spending went down, total expenditures fall, aggregate demand declines, GDP would go down. So anyway, everything can be reversed from what we were doing before, or I think it can. Everything I remember can be reversed. Okay. First of all, fiscal policy, let's define that. Fiscal policy is the deliberate manipulation, if you like, of government spending and taxes to influence economic activity. It's the manipulate, manipulate, deliberate manipulation, I think that's what manipulate means, deliberate manipulation of government spending and taxes, that G and T, in order to bring about a desired change in economic activity. Say it one more time. I'll try. Because I'm just making this up as I go, you know, so it's, I hope I make it up the same. It's the deliberate manipulation of government spending and taxes, G and T, in order to bring about desired changes in economic activity. I'll have to remember that and put it on the test. The idea of fiscal policy, you just saw it a moment ago, but let's make it very clear. Here's our total production curve, total expenditures curve, equilibrium GDP. And the idea is that that equilibrium GDP may not be natural real GDP, QN. And if you remember at this natural real GDP, that's where the unemployment rate is equal to the natural rate. And what's that? Uh, neighborhood 5%. So in this particular case, we have something called a recessionary gap. The recessionary gap is actually the difference between 
the existing equilibrium and the full employment level of real GDP. Okay, so the idea originally when Keynes wrote uh, his book, this uh, general theory, um, the idea was we're in a recession. How do we get rid of that recession? Later on, we can talk about the possibility of an inflationary gap. Suppose that instead, and, and we can only have one of these, so let me cross out the one. Suppose instead that natural real GDP was this smaller amount. Then we would say that, oh, we have an inflationary gap. The equilibrium level of GDP is greater than natural real GDP. The economy wants to perform stronger than it's capable of over the long run. We have inflationary pressures in play. So anyway, the idea is, I'll say it again, fiscal policy, deliberate manipulation of G&T, government spending and taxes, to bring about desired changes in economic activity, either to stimulate the economy or to slow down the economy. That's its purpose. Let's talk about a few terms. First of all, uh, government spending has got two components, government purchases of goods and services plus transfer payments. We, strictly speaking, we are usually not talking about total government spending. Usually we divide these two things out and we talk about government purchases of goods and services and G is the letter that I have assigned to those government purchases. And transfer payments, these are dollars, um, what, shifted from one person to another. Why do I distinguish between those? And, and here's the reason for this. Here there's no new production. There's no demand for goods. What happens is a dollar comes out of my pocket and it goes into your pocket. I was going to buy a hamburger for lunch with that dollar, but now the dollar's gone. I can't buy that hamburger. But now you have that dollar and you can buy that hamburger. And so really, when there's transfer payments, it may not have a very big impact on total spending. We're taking my money away. I spend less. You get the money. You spend more. Those are some offsetting things taking place. But here, I continue to spend the amount of money I was going to spend before, but all of a sudden, government's spending some on top of that, purchasing goods and services. And so that constitutes a larger increase in demand for goods. So we want to distinguish between these two things, the transfer payments. I'll use TR to represent that. The, the government purchases of goods and services from the transfer payments. And sometimes I'm a little sloppy and I say government spending, but I usually mean government purchases of goods and services. So you should always have that in mind. That's really all I want to do here, though, is define a few terms so that we're real clear on what's going on. Uh, taxes, I think everybody knows what taxes are, but taxes are unilateral payments by persons or organizations to the government. And the key here is that word unilateral. Well, the key is to the government. But the word unilateral, here's what that means. They just tell you, hey, send us some money. And, and if you say to them, well, you know, if a grocery store uh, owner said to you, send us some money, you would say, and what are you going to give me? You know, some soda, some hamburger, some cheese. What do I get for my money? And with the government, they say, send us the money, and that's the end of the story. And if you say, well, what do I get back? They say, we'll tell you, you know, like later on, if you're driving on the road and you see a road, that's what you get. But don't be asking us these questions, you know. And so anyway, unilateral. It's not a, 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 here's some money and I get back right then at the time in a clear way, I get back goods and services. It's not that way with taxes. You do get goods and services, but there's no relationship between you and the government in terms of you hand over the money, they hand back the services. You get the same services everybody does, those public goods that we were talking about a few minute, minutes ago. Um, government budget.
you'll hear people talking about the budget throughout your life, and really all they mean is government spending minus uh, tax revenues. I just told you a moment ago, I don't very often mean government spending, but here I do. I mean both forms of government spending, either for transfer payments or uh, for purchases of goods and services. So let's say the government, does anybody know how much the government spends in a year? <laughs> Close to two trillion dollars. It's not quite there, but <laughs> It'll be there before long. Close to $2 trillion. And right now, tax revenues are about the same. $1.8 trillion, two, someplace in there. What's a couple hundred billion dollars among friends? Anyway, so the government is collecting, uh, is spending and collecting about $2 trillion a year um, here in the United States. And that's all forms of government. Anyway, if government spending is greater than tax revenues, let me move over here. If uh, government spending, is greater than tax revenues, then we say that there's a government budget deficit. And on the other hand, if government spending is less than tax revenues, we say there's a surplus. There was a deficit in the United States from 1969 through 1998 every year. Almost, well, I guess that would be 30 years if you count uh, the endpoints. For 30 years, the government ran deficits year after year after year. Government spending exceeded tax revenues. What do we have here? Deficit is this situation right here. Government spending exceeded tax revenues for 30 years. Um, by the way, if you go back before 1969, there were no uh, surpluses in 68, 67, 66, 65, 64, 63, 62. In 1961, there was a surplus. So there was a small surplus in 61, there was a small one in 69, and other than that, really from uh, 1961, two years of surplus all the way up to 1998. So a lot of deficit. And then what we have is something called the national debt. And that's equal to the accumulated deficits. If you took all the deficits year after year after year, and then you subtract away the surpluses, then the total is the national debt. So what we have is the, the budget deficit or surplus. These are annual measures or one-year measures, the surplus and deficit. Okay. We have a surplus for this year or a deficit for this year. But the national debt, that goes back to when the United States first started. And then every time the government borrowed, we added to the debt. Every time the government ran a surplus and paid off, we subtracted from the debt. And so the national debt is, and again, ballpark numbers, uh, $5.7 trillion. That's kind of a lot, isn't it? If you think, and just take a second here to think about this, if the interest rate was 5%, and that's what happens here is when I say we have a national debt of 5.7 trillion, the government's got that much borrowed. If the interest rate was 5%, let's see if I can do this in my head, I think this is $285 billion each year in interest. And so that's more than $1,000 for every person in the United States. More than $1,000 for every person in the United States every single year just to pay interest on the debts that have accumulated in the past. And that's kind of a significant amount, isn't it? 
before Cain's, and we still haven't left the, the, the land of Cain's, we're still telling his story. Before Cain's, the United States had, oh, I, I'm sorry, I wanted to mention one other thing. Uh, where will I write over here? Expansionary policy causes an increase in real GDP and then a contractionary policy causes a reduction in real GDP. So when I use those terms, oh, that's an expansionary policy or that's a, a contractionary policy, we're talking about how does it affect the economy, real GDP. Okay, so back to Keynes. Keynes wrote his uh, book, this general theory of employment, interest, and money. He wrote that book in 1936. I've told you about that before. Previous to the time he wrote that book, there was this understanding about fiscal policy that we can call the old time fiscal religion. Before Keynes, and things are different since Keynes, but before Keynes, there was this feeling, and this feeling had grown over the, the decades, the centuries really, about how the government ought to manage its finances. And so, for example, the old time fiscal religion, balanced budget. We don't want the government going out and running up a bunch of debts. And I don't mean to say we today, but I mean, in these older times, we don't want the government going out and running up a bunch of debts. Balance the budget year after year after year, except for in very extraordinary times. A second thing, do not manage the economy that is to say no fiscal policy the government's not shouldn't be out there trying to increase or decrease gdp just if we need certain goods and services, the government ought to buy them. Public goods, we talked about those a few minutes ago. If we need public goods, let the government purchase those. That's a great thing. But if we don't need them, those public goods and services, let's don't be trying to manage the economy and government spending money in order to manage the economy. And the other thing is that we like to increases in government spending should be accompanied by increases in taxes. We need to have a, a, a clear understanding that every time the government spends some money, we're going to have to pay taxes. If we have the government just go out there spending money and no taxes, then that start, starts people thinking, that, oh man, we can have this stuff for free. And you remember that term, tan staffle. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And the way we make that clear to everybody is if we're going to spend money to put a, a highway going by your, your, uh, your city, we're going to have to tax you. If you want a hospital or a school, you have to pay. That was the understanding before Keynes. Keynes broke these rules, and that's what we will talk about next time. So long. <laughs>